Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the new human movement. We're uh, glad you found us or glad you joined us again. And as you know, we're doing a series of conversations with people who really care about uh, reinventing our organizations and the way they work. Uh, and today, another fantastic uh, thought leader, uh, very intriguing set of ideas, very passionate about them. Uh, Bruce Fuller is joining us. Bruce is a, a sociologist, a professor at UC uh, Berkeley Graduate School of Education. So he has the distinct benefit of not coming out of a business school of background. And interestingly, Bruce's research really started around families and children and, 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 and how do our institutions help children thrive, particularly schools. He's done a lot of work on that, which, which led, I guess, and Bruce will describe in maybe a circuitous way to a wonderful, wonderful 2015 book called Organizing Locally. Highly, highly recommended. If you want a real indictment of, of, of kind of the old bureaucratic model and some wonderful examples and pointers to some alternatives, uh, a, a fantastic, a fantastic book. And uh, Bruce has been working on a sequel of, of sorts, When Schools Work, uh, which talks about how a variety of uh, groups come together to uh, transform education in the same way we're hoping to bring a variety of folks together to transform uh, uh, management and the way our organizations work. So Bruce, welcome. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Michaela, for having me. So, so Bruce, let's let's kind of get into it. I mean, uh, you know, we want to get into some like really practical, deep questions, but but maybe start, Bruce, with a little bit of your story. How does somebody who starts out with a passion for children and education end up writing what is really a very broad-based uh, book dealing with private sector, public sector around the whole challenge of uh, decentralizing large organizations? What was what was your journey there? Well, I I, I sort of come from the the old left, if you will, from the 60s and 70s, Gary, and um, was sort of came of age at a time when hierarchies were being challenged, whether it was the Nixon White House or big corporations. So I, I sort of come from that tradition of small D Democrats and trying to empower people locally. Uh, I guess the other, the other autobiographical note is that I studied at Stanford University in the sociology department. Uh, soon after, um, Bill Ochi was there who wrote all about Theory Z and the decentralization of Japanese firms. So Stanford at, at that time in the late 70s was a very, uh, there was a lot of ferment there, both people in the business school, Jim March was still there, uh, Dick Scott, people who were trying to think about better ways of organizing the private sector firm as well as public sector and government organizations. So I come from that sort of tradition of let's Let's question hierarchy. Let's move away from the factory model. Let's think about how to organize production in, in more effective ways. And how did that? How did your graduate work? Uh, and I, I, you know, knew Bill, Bill Ochi, uh, fabulous guy. Uh, Love Theory Z. Uh, some of you, if you haven't read it, go back and read it. It's, it's relevant now. But what was the path that led you into in, into thinking about children and education, and 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 then back into this more general problem? Mainly the question, Gary, around non-government organizations and the role that uh, public-private ventures play in, in the marketplace. I mean, the, the biggest example today, of course, is the healthcare industry, which is services are delivered by a variety of nonprofits like Kaiser, Sutter Health. Uh, my book talks about the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania. But sort of this, this point of nexus between um, private nonprofit firms who operate often through hierarchies, but are trying to find ways of better serving patients, trying to find ways of better serving uh, banking clients in the case of Handelsbanken, which, which you both have explored recently in your own work. So this nexus between private-like firms that are trying to provide human services more effectively for people, and that necessarily leads to more decentralized kinds of remedies. So it does seem like there's a little bit of a hybrid, as you say. I mean, government is more and more relying on private sector firms to deliver services. You talk about that, although government also often puts a lot of constraints on them. And, and then you see new institutions that are growing up that are trying to solve these problems locally. I mean, one of the things that struck me about your book, uh, Bruce, is you are, you're, you're pretty relentlessly optimistic. So I want to start, and forgive me, I'm, I'm going to build a, a little you know, 
pessimist hole here. And I'm, I'm hoping you're going to have a ladder that will <laughs> that allow us to climb out of a little hole I'm about to dig here. Because certainly when McKaylee and I have looked at some of the evidence, you know, the fact that uh, the bureaucratic class, if you will, the managers and supervisors and so on, that that has been growing dramatically faster than other forms of employees, that, that, that the proportion of employees who work in very large organizations with more than 10,000 employees, more people work in those sort of, 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 of megacorps that, that, that then work in companies with 50 or less. So, so it seems, and then, and then if you look, you know, almost across every industry, you see growing consolidation and therefore centralization. I mean, that's, that's true in, in healthcare with, with, with enormous consolidation there. It's true in banking and retailing and airlines and in food processing. Uh, big companies like Uber and, and Airbnb uh, uh, dominate the so-called sharing economy. Uh, our evidence suggests that uh, average frontline employees have actually less autonomy than they did a decade or, or, or two ago. And and uh, and and yet, you know, you're you're saying that really localism, decentralization, is the only way we can build organizations that work. So first of all, are, is our trend data should we be more hopeful maybe right now than we are? And 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 why is this so important right now that we really push against hierarchy, push against bureaucracy? Why do you believe it's so important? And what gives you before we get into kind of all the how to and the mechanics? Why is this important, and and why are you kind of optimistic about this? Well, it's a great question, Gary, and, and the critics of my book have, have said I'm over-deterministic in my theory of decentralization. That is, I, I argue there are three or four massive forces that are going to continue to push against hierarchy, will continue to dissolve the assumptions underlying bureaucratic organizations. Uh, for example, the growth of service jobs. Um, yes, there's consolidation in healthcare. Yes, Kaiser becomes bigger and bigger in California, or Geisinger becomes bigger on the East Coast. But to maintain competitive advantage, they have to develop a reputation that they care about patients, they're responsive to patients, uh, they're innovating with new job roles, um, so that they don't become seen as sort of monolithic, big centralized organizations. I would argue the competitive edge is around creating staff that are much more responsive to what's local and to the, the needs of their patients. I think the other big factor is just technological change. As your viewers have, have talked about, I'm sure, and think about a lot, is the fact that, that knowledge development jobs, the so-called cultural creatives, you know, in, U, in the US and West Europe, this is where there's uh, value added in the marketplace. This is where the profit margins are made, is, through creativity and, and knowledge development jobs. So these are people that can't be controlled through hierarchy. In fact, if they are controlled, they move on to a firm where they're not controlled. So I think the nature of work, at least in first world societies, uh, is involving new kinds of technologies. Um, and then finally, I would argue that even Airbnb, um, my wife and I, Airbnb are back cottage, and there's constant emails about how to market locally. You know, what's special about Northern California, the Bay Area? How do you attract clients? So even these firms where there's consolidation, I think because of, because of the internet, because of the versatility of digital platforms, there's more of a concern with what's local. You know, thinking about farmers markets, thinking about telling our Airbnb clients what's going on with wineries up in Sonoma County. So some of this is kind of pseudo decentralization, but a lot of it I think is authentically trying to get a market edge by getting information out and being more attentive to what people want from the local, the local environment. So you're saying, and I'll, I'll throw out maybe one or two more questions then over to McKaylee. You're saying, Bruce, that there, there are some imperatives here that, are, that you, you believe, and I think we probably agree, that are kind of pushing organizations in this way. Uh, you know, one is this is what your, your, your customers or your constituents expect. And, and certainly in the world of business, they're kind of omnipotent now, and you really need to be able to pay attention to their kind of micro needs. Uh, you're also saying that it's what employees expect uh, uh, in service jobs and in creative jobs. I mean, we do see this data that a lot of work is kind of becoming shittier, pardon my language there, uh, 
uh, because a lot of people don't have that discretion. But you're saying that the longer term trend is people are going to expect this. Let me let me tie this to one other thing, because I want to go back to why you think this is so important and just throw one other thought out there and, and let you respond to it. I mean, one of the things that I've, I felt this way for some time, Bruce, you know, we know uh, and the data is kind of up and down year by year, but there's kind of been a long term secular trend where, where trust is eroding in large organizations, both public and private. And at least, you know, what I what I feel I've seen in many organizations is more centralization in, in government, in business. And if I'm a citizen or a consumer, almost inevitably, the more centralized something is, the less my voice matters. I have very little share of voice on some policy that's set in Washington or something that Apple decides to do corporately. So with that centralization, I have a smaller and smaller share of voice. And whatever those global solutions they come up with are, are very unlikely to be relevant to my surrounding. So I, I end up feeling, you know, they don't know me and they and they and they're not really responsive to me. So is is this crisis of legitimacy around large organizations? Is this tied back to this question of centralization in some way? That I, I've kind of thought it is, but you've looked at this more deeply. Yeah, no, I think it. I think it's right on point, Gary. I, I think number one, as as populations become better educated, young workers expect to have efficacy, and if they don't feel the sense of efficacy or control at their workplace, they move. They move somewhere else. So I think it's in the firm's interest to figure out how can frontline workers, whether they're bank tellers or production workers in assembly lines, how can they have greater control? It goes back to our old colleague Bill Ochi in Japan trying to figure out why were Japanese manufacturers so competitive for so long? A lot of it had to do with his T groups, his, his frontline workers talking about quality control and efficiency. And I think we need to bring that, that, that that uh, dynamic and that kind of intervention forward. I think the other thing that's going on is that as societies become more cosmopolitan and more pluralistic and more culturally diverse and we, and we grow to respect different cultural forms, I think even the federal government is figuring out we've got to, we've got to empower people locally, whether it's parents or workers, to make their own decisions. Even a guy like Joe Biden, who's kind of a, a reborn centralist, if you will, the Democratic Party. He's talking about tax credits for child care. He's talking about expanding the, the, the child tax allowance. He's talking about vouchers for preschool. So even, even central Democrats, who you might think would be pro-centralization, recognize this diversity, recognize different preferences that families have around child rearing and preschool. And he's going to finance a lot of that through vouchers and tax credits, not, not by expanding a central bureaucracy. So I think this cultural pluralism and the cosmopolitan drift in, in the U.S. and West Europe is, is part of the story as well. So, so Bruce, you've, you mentioned decentralization and localism a few times already. And I was wondering if you could help us maybe unpack that concept. So what do you mean by that? Because I think you make the great point in the book that often people think that that means just delegating authority down, but it's much more than that, right? That, that might actually be, if that's all you do, it may not actually work. So could you talk to us about what you mean by decentralization and maybe also provide some examples of organizations that do that and do that effectively? Well, in the book, I, I do talk a lot about uh, Geisinger Healthcare, which is uh, a big and growing firm in, in Central and Eastern Pennsylvania, they're, they're known for progressives as in terms of providing quality health care. They spend a lot of time on preventive health. Um, so one example I talk about in the book, Michaela, is, is um, an 89-year-old woman who has congestive heart failure. She has to be on oxygen to survive, but she doesn't like carrying these oxygen bottles around, these things that weigh about 80, 90 pounds. So what does Geisinger do? Well, first of all, they create something called a nurse navigator where she doesn't have to go into the local health clinic run by Geisinger, but there's actually a nurse navigator that goes out to this woman's home. Uh, this woman has discretion. She's pretty well trained as a, as, a, as a highly skilled nurse, but she has the capacity, and going back to Gary's point, she has the efficacy to figure out how to find uh, oxygen containers that are smaller, that weigh less, that can be wheeled around by this elderly woman. She installs these. She has 
she actually has a 30 foot uh, 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 cord that, through which the oxygen moves to this patient. And suddenly this woman feels liberated. She can move around her house. She can go to the kitchen. She can go out and call her daughter from the living room. And it's just a case in point where you've got this healthcare firm that's highly profitable. They do centralize around certain things like medical protocols and procedures, but they've created this whole new job role of nurse navigator. And then they delegate to those men and women the ability to make decisions in people's homes to, to improve the quality of their life and to improve their length and their mortality. So it's just one small example of a firm that's massive and has very high profit margins, puts a lot of in money into R&D, but they've dedicated themselves to figure out how can they decentralize these job roles to get to get a competitive edge in a, in a very competitive marketplace of healthcare. So, so Bruce, that's a wonderful example, and I think it, it points to a few important ingredients. The first is you know creating roles that are you know dealing with the you know the frontline roles, dealing with the customer, dealing with the patient, dealing with the student, where people have the not only the authority but they also have the skills right? And the information to make the right decision to make that, that those kinds of local trade offs. It also sounds like you mentioned decentralization is almost a, an activity an, an experimental process where you're trying out different ways uh, to uh, make those decisions locally, and some may work and some may not, right? And, and, and it's not like there's a cookie cutter approach that is uh, figured out once and, and for all, right? It's, it's a constant process, right? Of, uh, and, and that, um, and then the last thing is that there is a there is a uh, a corporate center um, that is uh, additive, you know, to the to the equation, right? So they're often, uh, you know, quite uh, you know um, uh, skeptical of local I innovations, and they try to squash them. But in in, in Geisinger and other examples, they are they are providing a, a a supporting role, right, where they're able to support these local experiments, share best practices, you know, uh, create consistency and, and standardization where it matters, but not where it does it. It's a really key point, uh, Michele, in the sense that um, for Geisinger, Handelsbacken, uh, the book also looks at charter schools. These are organizations that have a lean and information rich center. That is, they don't, they don't regulate they rarely regulate behavior. So going back to Geisinger Healthcare, the center uh, has protocols for how to deal with congestive heart failure, which is, uh, which is an expensive, extremely expensive condition in the, in the American healthcare system. So Geisinger reads the research, they have protocols, they have procedures, and they send those down out to their 35 different health clinics. So the doctors and the nurses have some guidance based upon empirical evidence. But then when the nurse practitioner goes out to the 89 year old woman's home, she, she knows the official protocol, but she also knows how to tailor it to this woman's uh, situation. So I think you're hitting on a very key point, which is this is a dynamic. You have people in Geisinger who wanna go back to centralization. You have people in Geisinger Health out in the clinics that wanna decentralize more radically. It's a dynamic back and forth process. But in the end, the center is a lean and information rich uh, center which provides protocol guidance coaching. But at the end of the day, these nurses and these MDs and the clinics are adapting this information to, to every patient, to every local condition that they, they, they confront. You know, let me, let me come back on another angle there because, you know, we see the same thing. We see in these organizations, what we would call them kind of the post-bureaucratic, you know, elite or the vanguard. Uh, the center really sees itself as a service function rather than primarily a compliance function. And, and that uh, most of the compliance and most of the knowledge transfer is peer to peer rather than like peer to boss. Uh, so that would be our experience as well. Having said that, you know, as you know, because uh, you've, you've looked at this, Bruce, there's a long history of, of trying to move power to the periphery of organizations. And a lot of great organizational theorists that came before us, you know, worked on this, people like Eric Trist and uh, uh, Ed Schein and, and others. And yet so many of the experiments in kind of self-management and, and local, localizing kind of, you know, had produced great results, but then stalled out and didn't, and didn't get uh, kind of um, institutionalized. 
And, and when you go back and look at this, and we've, we've had these conversations with some of our guests, but I'd, I'd like to get your view here. When you go back and look at like, why didn't these things take root? Despite all the benefits and the hope, uh, you know, the answer is the empire struck back that, you know, people that had spent a career accumulating using, you know, bureaucratic authority, right, were kind of unwilling to give it up. And it, and it seems to me, it feels like we're in a state right now, certainly in the United States, but I would argue maybe more around the world, where the elite has never seemed so out of touch with people on the front lines, whether whether in our country, that's the people who lined up behind Bernie Sanders or the people who lined up behind Trump or the people who voted for Brexit or whatever it may be. Uh, uh, and and so left or right, you know, and, and, and we know this from the data, there's a huge percentage of people who are saying the system is no longer working for us. So how, you know, let's let's start to kind of move towards 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 kind of practicality here because you talk about, you know, the localists, you talk about a movement here so given that you're up against people who may at one level, you know, they're not fans of bureaucracy, but they're not very anxious to see their authority distributed, right? And this can be senior executives, it can be union leaders, whatever it is. How, how do we start to deal with what essentially is some huge asymmetries in power, at least in existing organizations where, you know, the center's pretty deeply entrenched and they like the perks and they like the authority and they like the compensation that comes with that. Like practically, how do you start to to make some progress here? And you have to start something new to do it. Right. Yeah, my, my new book, Gary, looks a lot at the uh, the LA school bureaucracy, Los Angeles school bureaucracy, and, and how over 30 years they've resisted attempts at decentralizing schools, despite being hit over the head by charter schools and various movements. So I think I think you're you're right on point here, which is how do we disassemble those those procedures and structures that preserve power. I, I do think in the case of both Geisinger and Handelsbanken, which is you know another case in my book, and, and you and you guys have explored this deeply in the case of Handelsbanken, I do think the strategy has been to demonstrate that decentralizing can create more effective services and greater efficiency. So in the case of Geisinger Healthcare, and Kaiser Healthcare, Healthcare does this uh, here in California as well, there are, there are central uh, agents, uh, staff people from the center that go out and meet with doctors locally, and they review cases, much like in business school, where you review individual cases and try to learn from those cases. And the goal of the centralists in Geisinger is, is in part to protect the integrity of their protocols, to avoid malpractice suits. You know, they have centralized interests, but they do try to work with doctors and nurses to show how these protocols and procedures can be more efficient and more effective, either increasing mortality rates or decreasing costs for the organization. You see this in Handelsbanken too, where branch managers are given a chunk of capital each year and those branch managers can make decisions as to who to lend money to and who not to lend money to. And at the end of the day, Handelsbanken feels they have a bigger return on their capital by decentralizing. So a lot of this has to do with demonstrating the efficiencies, demonstrating the greater sense of efficacy in local staff, demonstrating that these are more effective ways to tailor service uh, delivery to, to local conditions. Um, now, to your point, you're always going to have people at the center that are going to want to pull back and become more efficient. You know, Handelsbanken sort of makes fun of Chase, Man Chase Manhattan trying to constantly centralize. Uh, you have to call New York City to get a loan approved from Stockholm. So there are definitely going to be people that pull back. But I think if you can have some advocates locally and centrally to demonstrate greater efficiency and effectiveness, then the centralization, the hierarchy starts to unravel and you have this movement. Uh, out to the local. Yeah, one of the things it's interesting that, and let's come. I'd like to come back to the LA example for a moment, if we can too. But one of the things there, you know, you talk about building the case and building the evidence that you just, you know, you're more effective as an organization if decisions are taken, you know, closer to the front lines, closer to your constituents. Um, you know, one of the, one of the recurring themes, Bruce, as we've 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 talked with our guests, is that right now a lot of our accounting systems don't really reflect that. So. So I can, you know, I can see what is the cost I save if I centralize an IT system. I, I can see, you know, I may avoid certain kinds of problems if I if I force everybody to follow a certain policy. What I don't see is the responsiveness, uh, 
the, the, the potential new solutions, the new knowledge that might create, be created, the innovation that happens when some of that gets relaxed and pushed out. Is, is this something you've come across too? Because it, it seems to me the old, the old kind of bureaucratic accounting system and measurement system, uh, you know, do, it doesn't capture the hidden costs of that centralization, which are real, but, you know, not pretty much mostly unmeasured. Yeah, I, I think it comes up a lot, Gary, in terms of staff turnover, which firms don't often measure. In other words, they, they're looking at their gross wage bill, whether they can contain wage costs, but they don't look at the, the hidden costs of, of turnover, the hidden costs of, of employees calling in sick and then productivity slows down. I think you're right. The way we think about accounting for costs hasn't really caught up with a decentralized model. Um, one thing Geisinger does, again, in the healthcare industry is they, they keep track of low turnover of doctors, low turnover of nurses in their organization. And they really feel that increases productivity and it, it, it increases mortality for patients. Um, they also account for preventive measures, you know, which, which firms don't often do. How do we avoid a problem? How do we avoid uh, increases in congestive heart failure or diabetes, whatever it is? So I think sometimes our accounting doesn't account for prevention. What are the costs we've prevented by decentralizing and empowering our staff to, to head off uh, costs that are otherwise hidden in the firm? One of the things you talk about in your book is as you kind of are talking about the features of these, uh, you know, of, of organizing locally is kind of a strong ethical imperative, you know, uh, which we might call a deep sense of purpose. And I'm wondering whether that is also, if you've seen that can be also a counterweight to kind of that centralizing or, or power hoarding tendency that when everybody kind of top to bottom, whatever it is, says, yeah, our goal is to help children succeed in school. Our goal is to reduce mortality of disease. That, that, that common purpose kind of helps to, to, to mitigate against, you know, the power games that, uh, you know, otherwise would be there. Is, 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 that what, is that what you see? Yeah, I think, I mean, you, met, you mentioned Edgar Schein. I mean, he talked all about the ethics uh, that, that, that are filtered down to your staff locally. I, I think that's absolutely right, Gary. Um, to go into the, into, the, into the public sector, charter schools um, are sometimes criticized because they have lower pay schedules uh, for teachers, or they will, sometimes they'll have higher pay for entering teachers than the regular public system to attract the best and the brightest teachers, but then they'll cheat a little bit on pension plans. But, but, but their view of this is that we attract people that have an ethical mission. We attract people who want to raise the achievement of kids. We want, to, we want teachers that are more responsive to, to parents, to our clients. And teachers that have that ethical, moral commitment sometimes are less demanding on the pay side. They, they don't demand unions in most cases because they feel they're pulling together in the same direction to lift kids and, to, and even to lift low income and working class families. So I, I think it's a great point, Gary, that if you can infuse your firm with this ethical commitment to pull in the same direction, you're not going to face as many liability suits. You're not going to face as many, you know, worker comp uh, problems because you've nurtured a culture that's that's moving in the right direction towards that that ethical commitment. Let, let, let's come back for a moment to the LA school system because if I and I may get this have gotten this wrong, just tell me and, and apologies if I have. But you know, you you said that you know over several decades you know, the system kind of resisted a lot of attempts at reform. But I believe in your work, and in, in more recently, they've seen real progress there. And, you know, many people, we you know, we know the data about how much we're spending per kid and educational outcomes, you know, often coming down. So is, is there a success story there somewhere in LA? And, and if so, what was the pivot from kind of defending the status quo to saying maybe there's a different way? Yeah, well, I'm tempted to pitch my new book, Gary, but it's it's well, you, not. You just it's, go ahead and pitch. I think it's, it's on not, point. It's not out yet. All it right. Goes, well, it goes it goes back to our friend Bill Ochi. When Bill Ochi moved to the UCLA School of Business, he got involved with Mayor Richard Reardon, who was a moderate Republican, and they kind of beat their head against the wall to to decentralize, to shrink the LA schools bureaucracy, to give school principals and teacher leaders more control over budgets, and over time. The, the teachers union just kind of beat them down. Well, what happened is some of the Latino and African-American groups came back with a very similar argument, which is we want to build schools 
the decentralized discretion over hiring and firing of teachers, it gives principals more efficacy and control over school budgets. And over time, these ethnic nonprofits, so to speak, essentially took up Bill's argument around decentralization, but because they were coming from a different political angle, have eventually won that argument. And so you had school board members and even senior bureaucrats. Uh, John Dacey was the school superintendent at the time. And he did decentralize budget control out to about a third of his schools. Uh, so we owe a lot to Bill Ochi in the public sector as well. And eventually people on the political left uh, be, embrace this decentralized uh, strategy and, they, and there's been quite a bit of success. And we've seen achievement go up in the LA schools almost uh, surprisingly over the last 20 years, in part linked to decentralization. So, so we, we, even in, in as politicized and entrenched sector, there, there, there's, there's, there's hope. Uh, Michaeli, back to you. Well, I actually wanted to go back to, to um, uh, Bruce to some of the reasons why decentralization um, is, is difficult to uh, sustain or for it to spread to, you know, some beyond the companies or the organizations that you've talked about and we've talked about, because let's face it, Handelsbank's model is still very much a kind of aberration within, within, um, within banking. Right. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I want, one of the things you mentioned in your book is, is this notion of an institutional logic, which I think is fancy speaking sociology for take, take it for granted assumptions about how things ought to happen in organizations. And I wonder if that's also part of the problem that is that we just, you know, whether it's through business school education or whatever is passed on from our bosses, but we just have a, a template for how order and precision and discipline uh, get achieved in an organization. And it is through this kind of bureaucratic model and template where it's, you know, the only way you get to, to the, you, you need managers to manage. You can't manage without managers, right? Or uh, it's um, the only way you get compliance is through, you know, a very robust function at the center with the right with the model, the protocols, and they are the enforcers, as Gary mentioned earlier, right? And it's curious, and I'll stop and get you let you react to this. But you know, Wells Fargo is, is a very good example, kind of a counterpoint to, to Handelsbank, right? Because they were hailed and celebrated for decades as a very decentralized, customer-focused organization. Then, you know, they had this fake scandal accounts, you know, that cost them billions of dollars. And the reaction to this was to centralize risk management, compliance, credit underwriting, all of those things in a way that hadn't been done before. And the CFO, I don't have the exact quote here, but he was saying, well, you know, a centralized bank is a easier bank to manage. It's a safer bank and we're not going to have that problem anymore. And so it seems to me like they kind of learned the wrong lesson, but, but it is the lesson that most consultants, most regulators, most business school professors would, would teach. So anyway, I'd love, love to get your take on this. Yeah. Well, I, it's a great example. I mean, when I talk to friends and colleagues here in the Bay Area who have been going to Wells Fargo, they throw up their hands and say, I'm just going to go to the local credit union because I can't get an answer out of these, these people that are now highly centralized. So I think it is probably the wrong, the wrong lesson. Um, but to your point, Michaela, I, th I think there is this reversion to standard operating procedure to reducing risk through central control. Um, I think government is doing this now too, where they feel, well, there's too much fraud and welfare, or, or, or we feel uh, kids aren't learning enough, so we're gonna have centralized testing, centralized control of the curriculum. But I, I think clients on the ground are trying to resist this to, in, in many cases. Uh, they're walking to credit unions, they're leaving big public school bureaucracies for charter schools. Um, I think there, you, you can see this in, in the air and in the culture, this reaction to globalization and the, the sort of false efficiencies that globalization brings. So this return to the local, I think, is, is not being read by a lot of people in, in Manhattan, a lot of people in corporate headquarters. They just go back to this Weberian set of assumptions. We just have to control things. We have to go to standard operating procedures. We have to standardize everything because that's the way we, we avoid risk. But on the ground, I think patients in healthcare, uh, 
clients in, 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 in searching out uh, more responsive banks. People are moving to farmers markets and, and not going to the Safeway anymore because of the quality problem. I think you've got millions and millions of clients that are trying to look for more localized, tailored solutions or looking to the share economy where, where Airbnb at least puts out information to providers of dwellings and rental properties that how they can tailor their advertising to local tastes and local preferences. So I, I think some of these firms are just not in touch with these kinds of localized remedies that clients and patients and customers are looking for. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. There's more of it to come. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Hire, the world's largest appliance maker and a global leader in the Internet of Things, for underwriting the costs of producing this interview. It's great to work with a partner who is so deeply committed to building organizations that elicit and deserve the very best that human beings can give. Now, back to our conversation. You know, one, one little anecdote on that, Bruce. I remember this was at least, I think, 20 years ago. I was talking to the leadership group of, of at that time, the largest a brewer in the United States. I won't name them, but everybody would know this company. It's famous for its beer. Uh, and, uh, you know, at that time, microbreweries were like about 2%. And, and, and this team said, it'll never be more than 4%, ever. And, and, and I said, I think you guys are mistaking, you know, they just assume everybody wants to, to, to consume the same thing because that was the economics of mass markets, but not one of us as a human being is a mass market. You're, you're right. Bruce and, right. and you're McKaylee and I'm Gary. And so what you're describing, and I think it's a hunger, whether we're dealing with the, with the DMV or whether we're ordering something online, I don't even know if it is so much local. What we're hungry for is relevance. It's, it's relevant to me, it understands me, it, it, it meets my need uniquely. And one of the things I think is important to emphasize about what you're saying when you, when you talk about Geisinger or, or, or Kaiser or Svenska Handelsbanken, these are not small organizations, right? The, the, the alternative, and it may, it may be part of the solution, but the alternative to centralization is not that we have, you know, a, a bunch of co-ops with 10 people, right? It, it, it's, it's organizations that can manage this tension of, you know, the, the direction, the coordination where you need it, but then the responsiveness where that adds value. And I think it's that both and that, 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 that has been missing, right? I mean, yeah, you know, you, you want the centralization to push efficiency. You want the centralization to be, to have an information rich hub, uh, going back to Michaela's point of, of coaching people locally, there are certain functions only the center can do, but you know, the other example I think of is Apple computer, which is highly centralized. Their design decisions are, all made in in, uh, in, in, in in you know in Silicon Valley and Cupertino, but but if I have a problem with my machine, I get to go see a genius at the Genius Bar, you know, who's only a half hour away. So I, I think I think it's not either or, Gary. I think you're raising a really good point that you can you can have a lean and information rich center, but then you can decentralize and tailor locally in ways that are responsive to customers and clients. So, Bruce, uh, you mentioned before the fact that, you know, it, it probably the change isn't going to come from people in Manhattan or in, you know, in the headquarters and, you know, in executive role, but rather from the periphery, you know, with customers pushing. But it, it also might come from, you know, people at the periphery inside of these organizations. And one of the things I loved about the book is that you talked about decentralists. You refer to people as decentralists, that is, you know, people who are taking it upon themselves, you know, really passionate about the cause of empowering people and serving customers or patients or or students and we're convinced that the best decisions are those made by you know the the people at the at, at the edge of the organization right and 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 you know you're so right to remind us that decentralization doesn't simply emerge out, out of thin air but it's a fruit of a long and kind of often arduous campaign, right? Led by activists. So I was hoping you could speak to this a little bit and maybe share some stories about, um, you know, from the front lines of your own research about, you know, what are the key lessons that organizational activists who are keen on pushing decentralization, you know, what lessons that they should take in, in being effective in this, in their in their organization? Yeah, well, not to, not to milk the Geisinger case too much, Michele, but, it, Geisinger, one thing the CEO of Geisinger did about 15 years ago is he started to promote nurse practitioners into management positions because he felt those were the mainly women 
who knew how to create more effective and efficient remedies inside health clinics. So this CEO, who um, very progressive guys, super smart, obviously, but he also had kind of the courage to, to bypass the MDs, to bypass the male surgeons, the guys that are super macho and decisive, and to hire some of these decentralists, these change agents, to, to not, not discard the medical protocols, not discard the research, but to come in and have some power in the organization to work with MDs in their local clinics to figure out ways, how could we deal with congestive heart failure? How could we deal with type B diabetes more effectively? Because these were the women who had seen the patients. They knew where the snags were in the local clinics. The other case that comes to mind, Michaela, and this is from a book by uh, Judy Samuelson, who's at the Aspen Institute. She has a new book out called The New Rules of Business. Um, she talks about all the activists in the supply chain. So this is kind of interesting. I have not done original research in this area, but she talks a lot about the breakdown in Nike when, when they had the major scandals around manufacture in China. And she argues it was really um, the subcontractors and people who knew what the conditions were like in rural China making shoes. And then the NGOs, the activists in the outside world who started to rabble rouse with journalists and then the whole thing blew up. But the, the backstory, which is not so well known is the Nike executives then came in to start to collaborate with the NGOs. Now they had enlightened self-interest to tap down the the political blow up around, around rural working conditions. But Judy Samuelson argues that, that those NGOs are also part of the change agent world, that they come in and try to work with companies to improve working conditions, to improve their public facing image. Um, so sometimes it's people outside these firms, Michele, that create the political pressure to decentralize and to, to localize. You know, one of the things, Bruce, you use a term, I think at several points in your book, um, and we've used a variant of this, but, but you talk about organizational architects. And because that's really what you're, you know, whether it's Geisinger or any of these organizations, they're thinking about new ways of bringing human beings together to do to, to collectively what we can't do individually. And the, one of the things you say, and I'm, I'm going to quote you right here for out of, out of, out of, out of organized level, you say, you say, it's, it's the quality of social engagement on the ground that advances the organization uh, over time. And that sounds a lot to me uh, uh, like you're, it's, it's really, we, we need to stop thinking of organizations as business units and divisions and so on. I mean, organizations are a series of tribes or a series of, you know, we sometimes call it, it's a community of communities. And I'm, I'm wondering, does that seem right to you? And if so, what do you see in these, or how do you strengthen that sense of community? How do you strengthen that, that social engagement on the ground when we know that, you know, 85% of employees around the world are not very engaged? So anything you can point us about, you know, is, 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 that, is that right to think, to, to, to increasingly, we should be thinking about organizations like communities of communities? And so how do you, how do you strengthen them? Yeah, I, I think that is, the, that is the, the bottom line question, Gary. Um, I do think of a I do think of a customer of Handel's Banken who I interviewed. This was in a, a a a branch office of the bank outside of Stockholm, and she she was the controller for a ball bearing firm in outside of Stockholm, and she used to go by the bank every week just to chat with the manager, <laughs> and it, it was kind of. Uh, she made jokes about how she was a good Lutheran, so she just had this obligation to go by and, and chat with the manager. It was sort of a quasi-cultural activity. But this is not disconnected with the economic policies of Handelsbanken. That is, the bank manager had a, had a load of capital she was given each year, you know, based on history and productivity of that branch. It wasn't irrational. But that manager had the capacity to make a decision whether to give this woman a, a line of credit that week or to hold back and say, well, let's, let's look at your profits over the last quarter before I issue that line of credit. So I think the social relationship is key. And these two women had, a, it seemed like they had a wonderful relationship. You know, they both had young kids. They, you know, it was kind of mano a mano at a, at a social level. But it was reinforced with, by the fact that the branch, the branch, 
the branch manager didn't have to call Manhattan to approve a loan for this ball bearing firm. She could make it on the spot when she felt it was within a reasonable range of risk. So the relationship side of this uh, is super important. Uh, I think Handelsbanken has an ethical mission to serve local communities. Uh, that's, where, that's their bread and butter. But it also requires decentralizing the power, the economic power given to local managers. It's that interaction between social cultural relationship and a new, a new set of agreements around who has power over, over the economics of this too. You know, Bruce, let me, let's come back to the public sector for a moment. I mean, you know, the, the private sector has plenty of problems around decentralizing and debureaucratizing it. You know, it's, it's, it's almost ironic that, you know, while a lot of CEOs at least will give lip service to, you know, free markets and open competition, when you go inside of those organizations, they often look like, you know, they're about as, 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 as feudal or as top down as, you know, the Soviet Union. But, but so I don't want to give like the private sector free pass. But if we go back to the public sector, you know, localizing seems like a big hurdle, you know, and for federal government to write a contract with, you know, a, a, a company to run prisons or do something else doesn't really necessarily localize. I can understand how they may transfer that. So are there, you know, are there ideological uh, barriers to doing this, uh, you know, because... I think so many of us, when we come up against government, whether it's local education, whether it's IRS, whatever it may be, you know, we, we see the Airbnbs and the Amazons that have figured out how to be hyper responsive and so on. And then you work with government. It's like, you know, so what do you think is going to be the fundamental hurdle there? Because we can't afford the government we have right now. I think most of us left or right probably have really grave concerns about its competence and its efficacy. So is 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 localizing a way to do you think dramatically improve the effectiveness and, and legitimacy of, of public sector services? Yeah, I mean the other case in, in in my book, Gary, is is this really fascinating case of the Veterans Administration in central Iowa, which was sort of a, a bizarre discovery from my research by my research team. But essentially the VA in Iowa was facing so many cutbacks, they could no longer provide counseling and services to all the vets coming back from Afghanistan. Still, there were still people coming back from Iraq. And um, for example, the problem of drug abuse among vets, you know, remains huge in this country. But the VA regional office in, in Des Moines realized they were gonna have to contract out two things. One is counseling for vets, and the other was to monitor drug use of vets. And, um, you know, there's telemedicine in the VA now. So you, if you're a vet, you can call in and get your prescriptions refilled. But you want to regulate that so you don't destroy people's lives through drug abuse. So in this case, uh, there were some visionary people in the regional office of the VA who knew two things. One is they knew they didn't have the staff to do this. They couldn't do this through regulation and through civil service staff. And secondly, they needed people in, in, in the communities especially former vets who could counsel vets. So what did they do? They contracted out to NGOs, to non-government organizations. So to your question, Gary, it, it, it does take some wisdom in government to say, hell, we can't do this well. Either we don't have the staff or we don't have the credibility. You know, vets hate the VA oftentimes. They, they, they dislike going to VA hospitals. It's a big bureaucracy. They wait in the ER for hours and hours. And the VA leadership in Des Moines, for whatever reason, realized this. They had an authority problem. So they, they did make the decision to contract out to a series of NGOs that we studied and interviewed in, in central Iowa. And the vets responded to that because the, the NGOs hired fellow vets to counsel. They hired fellow vets who might have been drug abusers in the military, but had, had gotten out of that and, and, and recovered. So it takes some wisdom. It takes maybe pressure for efficiency inside government. And it takes a realization that, hey, we can contract to charter schools or to, or to nonprofits or to private health clinics um, or to economic development agencies that are nonprofits now. It takes a willingness and a trust that, hey, we can let go of this. We can still monitor those non-government organizations and demand performance, but we've got to let go of this and trust that, that the nonprofit private firms can do it better.
which of course, you know, has happened, and not always, I would say, to the, to the good, but certainly in the private sector, companies, you know, have become, you know, they understand where they're, where they're specialized firms who may be, may be able to do something better and you outsource certain things to them. But I'm wondering, Bruce, part of what you're seeing there, I would suspect, is not necessarily that these NGOs, you know, uh, uh, you know have some great insight, but actually they probably have fewer constraints. So they, they, that, th there may be things that those local leaders in Des Moines would have liked to do within the structure of, of the VA. They simply, they, they can't negotiate that free. Well, they can negotiate as a contract and get somebody else to do it, but maybe they were facing internal constraints that they, they simply couldn't have been as creative in, in executing a solution as this outside party was. I don't know, I'm speculating. Oh, no, for sure, Gary. And they also, they also unload risk, right? So if, if an NGO screws up and somebody ODs in central Iowa, the VA bureaucrat doesn't take the hit, right? They blame it on the NGO. The other thing is labor constraints. I mean, charter schools, going back to education, charter schools are much more versatile. Uh, they can let go of lousy teachers. Uh, they can reach out to parents in creative ways because they don't have to sit down the bargaining table every every year and face a labor union that's trying to constrain the job role. Um, labor unions fight creativity, innovation, and new job roles. So yeah, charter schools, NGOs, these are ways in which government can experiment and, and also avoid risk as they're experimenting. You know, one thing um, that you didn't, I don't want to say you didn't talk about, but I didn't pick up uh, as a huge theme. You know, you, 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 you talked about kind of several of the features of these organizations that are adopting these more localized models. You talked about being, you know, intensely curious, committed to your clients, having this small information rich center that is really a, a service to support function, the deep sense of ethics that you need. So you're you're all, you know, competing to do the right thing rather than competing for 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 for, for power, about more more malleable and flexible roles as you were you were describing uh, those frontline providers at Geisinger. One thing that didn't come through quite so clearly is that, and at least it would seem to McKaylee and I, that what goes hand in hand with decentralization is accountability. And, 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 and that means, and accountability has a sharp edge. You know, we, we were talking, one of our, one of our interviews uh, in this series is, is with a former CEO of Nucor, America's largest, most profitable steel company. Frontline teams have immense autonomy at Nucor and yet their compensation can go up and down by 30, 40% depending on, you know, their, their, their productivity, their efficiency. And, and, and it seems to me one of the things that you so often, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, when you're on a helpline to somebody on the other side of the world in a company or whether you're dealing with a, with a government agency, there seems to be very little accountability. You know, one of the other companies we're very close to, we've profiled, written about is, is Hire, the, 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 the Chinese appliance company. Every, every single, 100% of the employees at hire have their compensation at risk depending on whether they're adding value for internal or external customers. So where does, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to say to somebody, okay, you have more authority and you can make decisions. It's another thing to really hold them accountable for the quality of those decisions and maybe even give them an upside like that, that spurs them to lie awake at night thinking, how do you make this better? So... What, what, what would you say about how, how accountability and decentralization you know, go together or not? Also a great question, Gary. I mean, jumping back to Geisinger, they, they have performance indicators. So this goes back to the lean and information rich center, right? So they put out a protocol, say, to lower diabetes rates in, in the local community. Well, Geisinger has people who track diabetes rates community-wide, and if those rates don't go down, there's pressure on, on the local clinic. They, they rank each of their 35 clinics based upon these performance indicators, and they also they do share uh, revenue uh, margins with the doctors and with the nurses based on, on those performance indicators. So it's not a, it's not a free-for-all localized <laughs> you know, have fun down there locally. There, there's, there's surveillance, if you will, and, and information gathering. Uh, in the charter school world, I think, you know, you have charter management organizations um, where you have a central organization like Aspire Charter here in Oakland, California, uh, rocket ship charters in Silicon Valley. They might have 20, 25 local schools, uh, 
but they also have very uh, finite metrics as to how kids are growing in reading skills, math skills, civics understanding. And those metrics are tracked by the central uh, charter management organization. So I think you're absolutely right. This, this, is, this sort of goes back to the electronics industry, right? Where um, Cupertino for Apple Computer will say, we wanna get you know, the new iPhone out you know, in two years and every unit has to, has to perform to meet that performance goal. But if you wanna write software at home in your sandals, um, you know, having a gin and tonic, go ahead. But, but if you don't perform against the indicator, there, is, there will be accountability. So it's sort of this combination of tightly coupling the performance indicators, but loosely coupling how, how frontline staff get to those performance standards. Yeah, it seems like what you're saying is in these organizations, even though they're quite, they're, there's a lot of autonomy, there's no place for mediocrity to hide. And, 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 and what is substituting maybe for those layers of oversight is a lot of transparency of your, t you know, it's, you know, your clinic, how are we doing with the diabetes measures of our patient and our, our cohort? Like that's that, that visibility, that transparency is kind of substituting in a way for what might've been, you know, a more vertical relationship. But at the end of the day, uh, people are very, very accountable. And I think it's important to say that because, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, freedom with accountability. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that produces any, 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 anything. You know, and anything it, good. And it sets a collective norm to be working together towards that performance goal. I mean, this goes back to Theory Z a little bit, and when the Japanese were riding high. You know, if you were a frontline worker, working with eight other staff, um, uh, building an automobile, and somebody wasn't carrying their weight. Well, that person was not going to last because they were not serving the collective interest around performance. So it it creates a collective commitment to we're in this together. We're going to meet our performance goal collectively, not individually. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, yeah, and I think you never want to underestimate the power of transparency and your peers. I you know maybe maybe our listeners have heard heard me tell this uh, a story, but. When I was a very young faculty member at the London Business School, literally in my first term, I was there were two 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 streams of the strategy course. I was teaching one as a new hire, and there was another young faculty member who was teaching the other stream. And after two weeks in the other stream, the students went to the dean and said, "This guy is no good," and the guy was fired. You know that kind of gets your attention very quickly, and and you realize that at the end of the term, you have a hundred students who are going to give you a rating. And everybody can see that, right? You don't you don't need a boss at that point. You you are accountable, you know, to your to your constituents and your students or your customers. And uh, I I think that that peer transparency and that direct accountability is an underused uh, an underused tool and a really good antidote to the kind of more bureaucratic controls. Yeah, yeah. So, so Bruce, I, I know we are probably going to run out of time, but I wanted to ask you a question about one thing that really struck me as you were. Uh, describing these cases, and that's uh, something that you refer to as distributed cognition, if I'm not mistaken. So the ability in these decentralized firms to pool uh, insights and expertise horizontally across the network without that being kind of orchestrated by a manager or a supervisor, and and that that is like an incredibly important source of uh, of uh, value creation and, and power that these organizations have over over their bureaucratic peers so could you could you maybe talk a little bit about that and, and provide uh, an example if you can yeah thanks for the question it comes from the work of gene lave and people in social psychology going back 20 years ago now gene was a colleague of mine at berkeley years ago um and the idea is that, you know, under Weberian logics, we sort of reward individuals for having expertise. So if you're an engineer, you get to move up in the organization, you get to compete as an individual. But in fact, and sort of linked to Gary's question, if you have accountability for the group, say the Geisinger Health Clinic, well, now, now the doctors have an enlightened self-interest in listening to what the nurses know, right? And if they can distribute that knowledge across the nurses, the MDs, Maybe the woman who sits at the, the receptionist at the front desk, maybe she's realizing something that's turning off patients as soon as they enter the office. If you create this norm that everybody's a partner in distributing cognition, distributing information, distributing what they know about 
the clients, the patients, and the firm, now you have much more pooled information upon which to create more productive remedies and more effective um, tasks and, and performance standards. So distributed cognition is an important principle as we decentralize. We don't want to decentralize and then have individuals competing you know, as bank tellers or as production workers. We want to decentralize and create a norm of, of pooling their knowledge towards uh, more efficient and effective remedies. Yeah, it see, and it seems to us that part of that pooling starts by recognizing that anybody around you can can have a great idea and that you know it, it is the physician who's willing to listen you know to the to the nurse practitioner rather than kind of write that perspective off and you know herb kelleher at southwest airlines their founder now now gone but he was quite famous for really banging on people and saying no position here is more important than another role and everybody's voice, you know, needs to be heard. So, uh, I had I had maybe a last uh, question, uh, Bruce, as, as as we wrap up. And it's something you know, McKaylee and I have been thinking a lot about. We don't have any magical answers here, but I think you know, while there are these positive examples, you found some of them, we found some of them. They still seem, you know, mostly as outliers. Maybe not quite aberrations, but outliers, positive deviants. And, you know, as we said at the beginning, a lot of organizations seem like they haven't really, you know, really started this, this, this movement towards localizing, decentralizing very seriously. So the question is this, you know, just like, you know, we brought some pressure to bear around diversity, around climate change, around some other issues. Do you see any ways through public policies, through grassroots movement, through legislation, do you see any ways that kind of pressurizing you know, organizations a little bit to kind of accelerate this shift in a way that builds better local solutions, enriches the jobs of people there on the front lines. Is there, have you thought about any 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 ways that we might uh, kind of collectively, you know, push this forward a bit as opposed to waiting for individuals to be inspired by what you've written or what we've written and kind of say, okay, I'll do this. <laughs> well, there's probably top down and bottom up uh, responses, Gary. I, I, I do think highly centralized firms, you know, going back to Michele's Wells Fargo example, I think we're going to be under pressure to move away from this command and control way to manage. They're not going to hold on to smart staff locally. Uh, staff will move on to other firms where they feel more efficacy, more discretion. Um, firms that are ignoring shifts in the, in the ecology of business like Nike or um, you know, I think it was Shell Oil just said they're going to pull out of the petroleum lobbying group because they, they don't face, they, 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 don't, they don't have the freedom to move into other energy fields and to reposition themselves politically. I think that's going to affect this sort of hierarchical mindset. And then again, just from below, I think there's cultural pressure around diversity, cosmopolitan thinking. Uh, we've got to tailor uh, products. We've got to have Spanish speaking bank tellers. We have to have uh, Mandarin speaking tellers, you know, in San Francisco. I think there are cultural pressures to create more discretion and, and to create a workforce locally that has more agility and more cultural relevance and skills. So I think there's, I think there's top down pressure and I think there's bottom up pressure on these resilient hierarchies that are going to stick with Max Weber, whether they, whether they live or die. So you're, in the end, Bruce, I'm taking away an essentially hopeful message because you're saying there is a tide of history, you know, more pluralism, uh, customers who are demanding more localized solutions, just, you know, governments reaching the limits of what they can do in that old model. And the tide may not be moving as fast as some of us might like, but I guess every institution is going to have the choice. Are you in front of, you know, are you in front of this or not? Uh so let me just let me finish by recommending people people you know watch out for your next book, please go read local uh, organizing locally. Uh, look at the first few chapters, which are a powerful argument for rethinking our organizations. Read the case studies, filled with lessons there. Uh, Bruce, just thanks a ton for adding your voice to this and all your wisdom. Uh, we're grateful to you, and, and thanks for being part of our conversation today. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Michaela. Great questions and really really fun dialogue. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you.